see everybody this morning, whether you're here in this sanctuary, sanctuary or whether you're at home, in the safety of your own home, we are so glad that you joined us today. We know that every single one of you brings something unique and wonderful to this service, and it is our fervent prayer that you take something equally unique and wonderful away. And as always, I'd like to thank our ushers and greeters who are still working this morning, um, seating everyone safely. We appreciate you greatly. It's just amazing. Can we give them a hand? Long time to be doing this. And also, I'd like to thank uh, Patricia Reese, who is our videographer today. Thank you, Patricia. Uh, we are getting the service out now on Sunday evening, so that, that will be helpful. And, yeah, you know, we're happy to do The whole team, actually. The whole team. And as always, we know that you are doing everything in your power to keep everyone safe, staying six feet apart, and wearing your mask above your nose unless you have a medical reason not to. And I really want to thank everyone who came yesterday for our food drive. Um, it was amazing. It was a great success. The weather was beautiful. Special thanks to everyone who worked, Donna and Larry Lambert, Rick Emnett, and Ray Swafford. Would you all stand? That you all were here for a long time. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And likewise, I want to thank our amazing prayer chaplains who were here yesterday afternoon. We were here at almost 5 o'clock for training. We completed our 2021 training, our training for next year, and so you'll be meeting them a little bit later on um, in December. But thank, thank them always. Especially thanks to Ann Hart, you and Mary Tuminello, who did a phenomenal job yesterday facilitating the group. So thanks to them especially. So, so our November newsletter was mailed last week. Be sure to open it. If you've received it in your email, it does contain all of our holiday updates. And also the forms for poinsettias, if you'd like to order one in honor or memory of someone, or just to grace our sanctuary, the forms are out in the sanctuary. They're spread out, so you can take just the one that you want to write on, and there are some pins there and a place for you to put them after, after you use them. So let's see. We are looking forward to um, a few elves coming with Saturday after Thanksgiving to help decorate the sanctuary and foyer only. Um, so we're going to just do eight people because that way we can stay socially distant. So if you're interested in that, some heavy lifting is required, but it's not all heavy lifting. So we would love to have you if you want to join us for that. Um, is there anything else that I've forgotten for the good of the cause announcement wise? Are we good? Okay, well then it is my great pleasure to announce that we have two people who are going to officially join our church today, and that would be, Mr. Bob, would you do me a favor and go get my white book off my desk? <laughs> I didn't know how to unintrusively ask them. Um, that would be Rosemary Sangline and Joan Rose. Would you come forward, please? Thank you. So as soon as Bob gets back with my book, we'll begin this ceremony, right? Talk amongst yourselves, okay? If you could do that without getting closer. I don't sing and I don't dance, so I'm not sure how else to fill the time. No, Bob, it's not. Bob, it's my wedding book, my white wedding book. <laughs> this is embarrassing, sorry. Okay, times like this, I wish we would stop the tape, but that's all right. <laughs> It's real, which is good. I will just fill the gap with one little thing, and that is um, we are taking reservations this year for our candle lighting ceremony.
So if you would like to come, please reserve either online or by calling the church office and leaving the number in your party with Sarah. If we have more people than we can accommodate in the sanctuary, then we will um, actually have two services just for that day. And the date is December 20th. So, all right. <laughs> I could maybe do it from memory, but... <laughs> Sorry to make you all stand here. Here he comes. Yay, Bob. Give him a hand. Chaplains for today. 
You will find us after the service in the rear of the sanctuary, waiting to pray with anything that is on your mind and on your heart. Uh, please remember your prayers are always held in the strictest of confidence. Uh, due to COVID, we ask that you remain seated in your pew until the ushers have emptied the sanctuary. And at that point, you may approach one of the prayer chaplains. Uh, just remember to keep your social distancing and this little thing. <laughs> okay, the word for today out of the daily word is healing. And the statement for today is, I embrace the healing flow of divine life. Will you say that with me? I embrace the healing flow of divine life. If my body experiences any kind of health challenge, I turn within to release all fear and all concerns as I affirm that illness is not part of my true identity. I remember that wholeness is my birthright as a spiritual being. I surrender any anxiety as I fill my consciousness with healing thoughts. My mind's eye sees each cell of my body aglow with the energy of divine life. In prayer, I express appreciation for all of my body's marvelous functions. I commit to taking time to bless my body with rest, exercise, and good nutrition. I speak affirming words of truth to encourage my body's healing response. I give thanks for the healing that I know is already on its way. I am grateful, grateful to receive healing and know wholeness. And from John chapter 10, verse 10, we read, I came that they may have life and have it abundantly let us pray. Dear Father, Mother God, your unlimited healing energy radiates throughout my body, our body, restoring, revitalizing every aspect of our being to wholeness and perfection. Wholeness is our spiritual birthright. And we claim our oneness, <clears throat> excuse me, as we feel our minds, fill our minds with infinite, infinite positive and nurturing healing thoughts. We release our anxiety now, Father. Right now, we release. We let go. We trust. And we feel the peace. We feel the healing peace. We thank you, most precious spirit. And so it is. Amen. <clears throat> Her hallway was a long period of uncertainty and disease, 
wherein she felt like a victim of fate. Five or six months into it, she made a shift. Lisa says, I realized I was defining myself and becoming my illness. That wasn't who I really was. I didn't want to be sick and unhappy. I wanted to be joyful. Coming to the conclusion that her answers, her healing, was really from within, she stopped focusing on what was wrong with her body and took time to explore what she wanted to do and be. She said, it wasn't until I accepted the belief that I was in control and had the power to turn things around that I was able to open the door to a new beginning. The second story is about Jan, who was diagnosed with colon cancer. And days after her diagnosis, her minister told her, don't fight this. Anything you fight, fights back. Love it, bless it, and let it go. So during radiation and chemo, Jan intensified her spiritual search. And shortly before surgery, she felt that she received a message from the divine. And the message was, love is the key to life. From that point on, all of her lessons in her recovery seemed to be about love. Love it, bless it, and let it go became her mantra. Unity co-founder Charles Fillmore tells us that the word bless means to invoke good upon, to call forth the action of God, to confer God's good on something or someone. Jan says, I lived my life differently. I became much more open to love. I stopped being so controlling. I learned to put shields up to block negativity. And the universe responded. Friends, coworkers, even total strangers came to take part in Jan's healing. They made it a, pro a project. So both Lisa and Jan used the time in the hallway to connect to their innate wholeness, the subject of today's daily word. Jan has some thoughts for those facing a frightening diagnosis. Now, I believe that her advice applies to all kinds of healing challenges, not just the physical ones. Here's what she says. Her first insight is fear blocks healing. She suggests that we just remember to breathe, inhaling the, the, just the healing light that penetrates every cell of our bodies, and exhaling anything unlike wholeness. Don't become your diagnosis or your problem. On the first day that Reverend Jim Rosemurgy returned to his church in Florida after a heart attack, he announced, let's be clear, I never ever said my heart attack. I don't own it, just exactly what the Daily Word said. It is not, was not his identity. Jan also advises reading something spiritual that lift, uplifts your soul every single day, spending time creating affirmations, listening to music, watching something funny, or hanging around people who are fun and keep you encouraged. She says, you can be sure there is healing in every single situation. Just love it, bless it, meaning invoke good upon it, and release it. Now I know many of you know the ancient Taoist story of the farmer and his horse, but it's the best example I know of of what we're talking about today. The farmer owns only one horse to till his many fields, and one day the horse runs away. So all of his neighbors gather around commensurating with him. Oh, we're so sorry, what bad luck. And the farmer said, well, who knows what's good or what's bad? Well, the neighbors are really confused because in their eyes it does look bad. But a few days later, the horse comes back, this time with 12 wild horses, enough to till many fields. So now the neighbors gather to congratulate him. Oh, this is wonderful. This is amazing. This is good. And the farmer replies, good or bad, who knows? Well, a few days after that, the farmer's son is, is taming one of the wild horses when he's thrown off and breaks his leg in three pieces. 
The neighbors gather. Oh, we're so sorry about your son's accident. This is very bad. This is a catastrophe. And I bet you can guess the farmer's response. He says, good, bad, who knows, we shall see. And sure enough, a week later, the army comes through the village and conscripts all able-bodied young men to go to war. When they come to the farmer's son with his leg broken and bandaged, they decide that he's no use to them, and so they let him be. Once the son is recovered and the horses are tamed, the farmer is able to plow his fields and provide food for the entire village. I love this little story because I think it really helps us see our human propensity to jump immediately to judgment about everything that happens to us. We seem to have this need to label everything good or bad, right or wrong. And Ellen says, and this is absolutely beautiful, Ellen says, if God is all there is, then every event or circumstance is immersed in divine love. Those we label good and those we label bad. We learn and grow from both pain and joy, from difficulty and success, from health and sickness, from wealth and poverty. And someday, when we are in some other form, we will know the total perfection. Ellen also says that in some cases, leaving the hallway might not really be possible, but being out of hell is possible when we are able to accept where we are. It's that acceptance piece that we talked about a few weeks ago. We can breathe and feel the good even if we can't yet see it or name it. And if good seems impossible, then we can always feel God's love and the love of other people. And one day, we will be ready to open the door. Ellen quotes author and life coach Rana Detrick, who said, one day, you will feel your heart's healing. One day you will look up instead of down, sleep more deeply, and breathe more slowly. One day you will know more laughter than tears. Your faith will sustain you, hope will return, love will beckon. One day you will know. And on that day, maybe when you least expect it, you will see the door before you and you will be ready. With a tender and ferocious heart that is raw but strong, you will step forward, reach out and turn the knob, and step through into the light, into the open, into the new. Head held high, shoulders back, you will radiate the glory that is you when you are fully awake, alive, and aware. And in Revelation 3, 8, we read, See, I have placed before you an open door, which no one can shut. So, at last, it's time to open a door and walk out into the hallway. But how? How can you do this? Well, actually, we need to be able to kind of prepare our consciousness before we leave this time of reflection and recovery. And here's what Ellen says. This is one thing I know for sure. Consciousness shifts first. Your thoughts, feelings, beliefs, attitudes, and expectations, both conscious and unconscious, rise to a new level, expand into new awareness. And the breakthrough comes differently for every single person. One day you might hear yourself laughing for the first time in a long time. Or realize that you are actually looking forward to something again. One day you will peer down that long hallway and see a glimmer of light at the door. For some, this is dramatic and immediate. But for most of us, Ellen says, it looks like an EKG sometimes. Up one day, rising to hope, and down the next, sinking back into despair. The first time I read Ellen's book, I thought, well, here's where her, break, her, her metaphor of the hallway breaks down in the doors. Because you're either in the hallway or you're not, right? However, the more I think about it now, I'm thinking that maybe this is simply a reference to a different kind of door. Maybe it's a revolving door. 
And eventually we stop circling, we stop coming in and out of the hallway, and we get to the point that more and more moments are spent in light than in darkness. Leaving the hallway doesn't mean, unfortunately sometimes, that our outer circumstances necessarily change. You may not find a new job, or you may not be married. You might still be caring for a child with special needs or a critically ill family member. You are still dealing with this pandemic right now, and we cannot really exactly see what the future is going to hold. But it's when we spend at least a little more time looking forward than we do looking back to what could have been that we are really ready to leave the hallway. Ellen cautions, first we have to ask ourselves, very important question, are we truly ready to leave the hallway and open the door? She says that some people never make it out of the hallway, doors don't seem to open for them, opportunity doesn't knock, they seem to be victims of circumstance. It might sound something like this. No one is hiring. I might as well not fill out an application. This prognosis has ruined my life. I have nothing left. Now, it's not unusual to become discouraged in the hallway, and that should not be condemned. We should just be gentle with ourselves about that. But we don't want to get too comfortable there. Ellen writes, and I love this, Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I do not pitch my tent there. <laughs> the doorway to freedom and joy is one step away. You are ready to open the door when you realize peace of mind is not contingent on outer circumstances. When you know that you will be all right no matter what happens. When you take responsibility of your life from this moment forward, the past is over. And when you set the intention to be the person you want to be, you take a step, move your feet, and begin to act. It's unity principle number five, live the truth you know. It's not about sitting and waiting for God to spring open the door for us. First and foremost, the new door has to open from within. Ellen says, years ago, Latching on to the law of attraction, she thought leaving the hallway was entirely up to the individual, that we are all creators of our experiences. Finally, however, she began to see that getting out of the hallway is not God's job or the individual's job, but it's actually a joint effort. It's co-creation, and it takes place within our own souls. The hallway ends first in consciousness. The door that opens to our good is the door of our own minds, attitudes, and convictions. So, how do we accomplish this shift? And Alan has some ideas, and they are. And some of these we've already talked about. But first, we acknowledge and accept what happened. Life has changed. We focus on the now. What can we do in this now moment. We let go of anxiety, fear, and judgment. Judgment of ourselves and judgment of others. This is where forgiveness comes in. We become courageous. We trust in our inner light. And we live, right, and we live in gratitude, always looking for the good. We cultivate patience. It takes as long as it takes. And lastly, we choose powerful over pitiful. Reverend Ellen says, as you look ahead to the rest of your life, or at least to the next step, if that's all we can see, there's only one important question, and that is, what do you want? You get to choose. Will you live the next chapter of your life by design or by default? Awareness of the creative power of our thoughts that we attract ourselves to whatever we focus on is really an ancient spiritual teaching. We can, we absolutely can, it's what co-creation is all about, it's what the creative process is all about. We can attract ourselves to love and peace, 
prosperity, all of the things that we want and need. Reverend Ellen says, pain pushes you until a vision pulls you. Your desire to feel better propels you through the hallway. You have released any idea that you're a victim. You have viewed the hallway as an opportunity for gifts and growth. You have set the intention to open to divine inspiration and to use your spiritual powers of imagination to envision infinite possibilities beyond anything you once ever dreamed about. Ellen calls desire, the word desire, an evolutionary process that keeps us reaching for the stars. The word desire does get a bad rap sometimes because we associate it just with selfish needs, with ego needs, but the root of the word desire, does anybody know what it means? It actually means from God. Desire from the Father, from God. Charles Fillmore writes that our desire to excel is from the Holy Spirit, God in expression. And Unity author Emily Cady said, Desire in the heart is always God, tapping at the door of your consciousness for your greater good. Now, I don't know about you, but growing up in traditional Christianity, I thought that what God wanted for me and what I wanted for myself were definitely two different things. I really did. Now I understand that the will of the divine is for my and everyone else's ever unfolding good. And so our mission is to look beyond the surface of our passing whims to our true longings. And Ellen says, what we really long for is wholeness, and we will get it wherever we can, often looking in all the wrong places. We use lovers or alcohol, money or possessions to fill that God-created hole inside. And our suffering is not the result of our desires, it's the result of our misguided efforts to avoid pain and find pleasure. Our deepest desire is for divine connection. And we can find it in many ways, not just in prayer and meditation. We can find it in laughing with friends, playing with children, enjoying good food and music, reading a life-changing book. They are all experiences of God. This last week on my day off, Bob and I had the great pleasure of having our six-year-old grandson, John, for the day. And we did a nature scavenger hunt communicating with walkie-talkies, which he loved. So at one point, John was in the front, and I was way in the back, and we were looking for something shaped like a Y. That was one thing on our scavenger hunt list. Find something shaped like a Y. So suddenly, his voice came over the walkie-talkie, Grandma, Grandma, come quick. I found it, I found it. And when I reached him, he joyfully held up the dirtiest stick you could imagine <laughs> that was in a perfect shape of a Y. And his little voice was just illumined with joy, and he yelled, This is it! This is it! Isn't it cool? Life is full of joys. We just have to pay attention. Maybe that's why Jesus said, Unless you become like a little child, you will not inherit the kingdom of heaven. So Ellen says, Designing your life is like tending a garden. One more metaphor. With right, the right timing, healthy soil, rain and sunlight will reap all the flowers or vegetables that we planted. It's an example of conscious co-creation. We don't control the seasons, but we can plant the seeds. We don't make the sunshine, but we can decide how much sunlight each plant needs and place it accordingly. We can't make it rain, but we can certainly get out of the garden hose to help nature out, right? In the same way, we can use the omnipresent energy of God to create the, the conditions that we desire in our lives. Tending the garden is a daily process of aligning with the divine through prayer, meditation, reading, singing, being in nature, appreciating whatever shows up, and taking whatever actions we need to take. Opening the door to the love of the divine and to our own spiritual powers means doing the work, first of all, 
of pulling the weeds of separation, hatred, and discord, and then of planting the seeds, the seeds of love, harmony, and peace in our personal lives, in our country today especially, and in the world. And so it is. worry and angst. 
Those are not the truth of your being. You can be courageous, courageous to make the shift to what is spiritually true and to step out of the hallway into the light. Your time in the hallway is a time for reflection and spiritual growth, a time to ask, what is the situation calling me to be? How long this lasts and where it takes you will suit you uniquely, all in preparation for opening the door to a new beginning. So take another deep breath. And can you see the glimmer of light at the end of the hallway? Are you looking forward more than looking into the past? Are you willing to open that door? Reverend Allen tells us we can let go of the past without losing our memories and love for the people who are there. We can let go of old habits and thinking without losing who we really are. Your soul is still expressing God as you, even if your outer circumstances change. You are being shown the way to create your desires. Trust that the door will open when you are ready, and trust that there is light on the other side. You are free to design your future from this point on, when you are ready. Contemplate this for just a few moments in the silence. And so now, as we come together as a greater spiritual community, we live in divine expectation of our ever unfolding good. And so it is, and so we joyously allow it to be in the name and through the power of the Christ eternal, we say thank you, God. Amen and amen.
Thank you.